We say welcome to everybody here. We're glad you're here. I'm glad everybody here is online today. Uh, we've been setting records for us online every week. It looks like it's gotten a little bit more and more, you know, and so it's been real exciting to be able to bring a lot of important information to you. Today is going to be one of those times that I feel is a very, very important information. This is part three on lessons from Lincoln. This will be the conclusion. And what I did this week is I tried to pull out a lot of the, uh, the technical and try to put more of the spiritual involved into it to try to begin to make sense in pulling together parts one and parts two and put together parts three. I think you'll see when you get to the end of this sermon that where we are today, it appears from everything I can see and looking at all the series we've put together in the last seven years, from the news that's been coming out, the way things are changing in the world, it really looks like God is merging things to a hot spot. And it's almost like the Civil War with Abraham Lincoln. We're lining up for the final battle. So today I'm going to go into part three. So I want you to think about something here. God is writing a book. Now I know we have a Bible. But God is writing a book. I don't believe that God has finished telling the story. What God has done throughout history of mankind, when man reached a certain point of time, he called a scribe or a prophet, and he said, go write down what you just saw and what just happened. And he recorded it for future generations. We see that with Jesus Christ, with his apostles. After he had died, he had them go and record what they had seen and what they had heard. And the Bible says that they had recorded everything that Jesus was prophesied of his coming, that he fulfilled every single prophecy. And I, I believe, and I have no doubt, that every prophecy of his second coming will be fulfilled also at some point in time. We will be in the millennial reign, and Christ will call us to Jerusalem, and someone have written out that he had fulfilled his second coming, just like he did in his first coming. Because he says he changes not. I believe that that will happen. So in the book that God is writing, we have a beginning and an end. He said he has told us the end from the beginning. We know how it will end. No matter how bad it gets between now and then, we know it has a great ending. But God has left many blank pages telling us how we're going to get to that end. Now, this is very important for you and I. There's a blank page. So I wonder when the scribes begin to write in the millennial reign about what happened at the end time, that one of those pages doesn't have your name in it. And why not? Look in the New Testament. How many people who have their names written in that book? And he will use that to teach the generations that will come during the millennial reign. Now, he's also left out whom he will use to get us there. So we don't know. If I come to you and I tell you, or I ask you, who are the two witnesses? You don't know. Of course, everybody's met at least a couple of them. I remember meeting three of them at one time. The two witnesses. So not only do we have blank pages, we don't know who God's going to use. So we don't know how we're going to exactly get to the end. So part of this series that we're learning from Abraham Lincoln is putting together some of the understanding is that we understand the end product of what God's trying to accomplish. So we can see the structure of what's taking place, right? The structure is God's plan for salvation. So we can see that. It's a finished product when you look at the end of what God's trying to do. But even that's a mystery because he has blinded people who see and they don't see. They have no clue what they see. But now the blank pages, that's where we're talking about today. The blank pages in God's book to bring us to the end. It's the framework. 
It's the framework of how God puts together all the little nuts and bolts, all the people that he uses, the tools that he has called into his work to fulfill the building of this, this massive building. And he says all of this is built upon the prophets and Jesus Christ being a chief cornerstone and all those that would come after is being built on that. So if you want to know what God's going to do, you go back and look at what he did. And by putting that together, there's a, I call it, does it pass the test? My test is when somebody says, Tom, you know what I think about this? They'll read a verse and they'll say, you know, I think it means this. So does it pass muster? So what do I mean by that? I say, well, does it fit into the framework? Does it fit into the structure of what God's done? Does it fit into the former or the latter? The physical versus the spiritual. Do you put it all together? Does it all tie in and have a plan to go? Or is it out there in left field all on its own to make the building crumble? So it does it pass muster. So when you come across somebody says, I got this great idea. Go, ooh, 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 let me tell let me you, I got this new thing. And it's usually not a new thing. It's usually just out there in left field. But at the same time, God's revealing things we never had before that we didn't know, that he says he's going to reveal at the end time. So when someone comes to you, does it pass muster? Does it fit the plan of God? The framework of the events to happen at any given point in time in the structure. If I came to you in uh, last November and I said, by the way, you know there's going to be a pandemic in a couple months and the whole world's going to be in chaos, we're going to lose trillions of dollars, for the first time in history, the nation's going to be shut down. Nobody's going to be working. Could, could anybody predict that? God did. And I'm going to show you how today. By understanding the former versus the latter. We didn't know when, but he showed us the former throughout time and how it all fit. You're going to be, you're going to be amazed with what I'm going to share with you today. No, I'm not being out on left field. I'm not going crazy anywhere. It's going to fit the pattern of everything we've been talking about. All right, so there's many insights into Lincoln's life. One of the most amazing is what is staring is in the face but is not seen. It is the modern-day version of 1 Corinthians 10. Any idea what 1 Corinthians 10? It's the Israelites coming out of the wilderness. That, almost that entire chapter, God says, I recorded all of that so that you don't make the same mistakes. Do you think the people back coming out of Israel would say, you know, I just can't wait 2,000 years from now, or 4,000 years from people, read about what we just did and how it's going to help them. What about today? And this is what I mean staring us in the face. What if what we're doing today, the work of God, the plan of God, what we're putting out, the work that goes out, is being recorded and written for those who will come in the millennial in the second resurrection. Why not? God doesn't change. He says, I'm the same. I change not. Did not he record those in the New Testament like he did those with the children of Israel for you and I so that we don't make those mistakes? Why would you think it's different for us? Now, that puts the ball game of this book into a different perspective because you might be in it. Let's hope it's in a good way. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened to them for examples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. They thought the world was going to end 2,000 years ago. So the people who lived through those events had no idea how God intended to use those events for the future of mankind. You come to somebody who will come say, you know, I don't know why God's letting this happen to me. What if that sentence applied to that situation? Why would it not? How about this? Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Right. So I've done quoted this twice. For I am the Lord and I change not. Malachi 3 verse 6. Then he goes on to course to say, therefore you sons of Jacob, you're not consumed. 
So I'm going to submit something to you today. That God has not changed. I'm not stepping out of the limb. I just read it right in front of you. And is still doing what he has done in the past. Can we kind of agree to that? That's nothing new. But doesn't that put in a different light where you stand today? So when you go to do something, how do you not know there's an angel watching you recording it all so that they can use for, for the future next generation that's coming? Because I would have a hard time believing that one of the most important times in the history of mankind, the way the Bible says, like no other time in history, never will be again, that God's not having someone ready to record it. It would make no sense. Because you go through the first five or six chapters in Genesis and you've lost almost 2,000 years. Those events didn't apply to a lot of things. You didn't start getting specifics until Noah, and then right after that, when it got really specific, Abraham. That's when we began to set the plan of God out. That's when those things began to affect you and me. And from that time on, all the events that centered around what God told Abraham from the beginning have been recorded through generation after generation. So now, if what I just submitted to you is true, then Isaiah 46.10 says, Revealing the end from the beginning is confirmed in us by what we're going through. Because we are the end time generation. So now that takes the Bible out of theology into real life. Here and now, with you, day by day. Thereby, the events of the people who lived through the, later, the latter days, even the last 400 years, so keep that in mind now, 400 years, without ever knowing it, or no different than the Israelites who came out of Egypt and the lives and events of the latter, confirming the lives and the events of the former. So what you're going through confirms what they went through by what God promised would happen. That's pretty exciting. That's, to me, that's pretty exciting. I don't, I don't know how you feel about that. But it's real of what's going on here. All of this could only be understand, stood when revealed to the end time generation as told to Daniel. Before this, you could not understand everything God had put together, but looking back, we can. Looking forward, we couldn't. Just like today, you can't tell me what's going to happen next Tuesday. You can't tell me when God's going to begin to have the two witnesses on the scene. We know they're coming. Now, when Christ comes back, I can say, okay, oh yeah, they, they began here. But we can't tell you now. So if Jesus Christ is coming back in the next 10, 15 years, in all probability, those two witnesses are on the scene here today, somewhere. Where are they? Who are they? They probably don't even know themselves at this point. All right, well, now, with all of that said, let's get down to the sermon and start putting the pieces together to finish up Lincoln. The three examples of the later day events that I want to use for today. One of them is what was one of the center points of the sermon series is the man to stand in the gap, Lincoln's assassination. All right. He stood in the gap and he was crucified for it. He got killed. Two, the three phases of going into captivity. Tying in Israel from a former to a latter. And by the way, you're living in that latter of the three phases going into captivity again, whether you realize it or not. And three, the end time fulfillment of the promise to Abraham of 400 years that your ancestors will return. Believe it or not, you're living through that in your lifetime today. Now, does that shock anybody? It should, but I'm going to show you how today. You're going to be amazed when this sermon's over today. And I'm not going out on a limb. I can tell you that with all confidence, what I just said right here. Not only can I tell you, I'm going to show you today. Lessons from Lincoln build around two primary points. First was it began with this, with this phrase, I see a very dark cloud on the horizon from Abraham Lincoln, and that dark cloud is coming from Rome. When I found that a couple months ago, it's like everything in my head just all lit up. All them little script, scriptures, you know, it's like yeah, you, you, you see something lighting up on the board, I read that, and all of a sudden, bing, 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 all these little things lighting up in my head. It's like, whoa. I didn't know what I stumbled on at the time, but it was incredible, and that's where this series began, and we're not even close to being finished, but I will finish the series today. And the second, 
what will it take to overcome the next civil war when it arises? When is centered around Ezekiel 2230. Ezekiel was the prophet sent to Israel after they had gone into captivity. The Ezekiel is the end time prophet for you and I today. So God asked the question, will he find a man to stand in the gap? And God answers the question at the same time. He says, no, he says, there is no one to stand in the gap. So that's got to tell you something. Lincoln stood in the gap and he got, he got killed for it. Pulled the nation together. When there's no one to stand in the gap, there is no one to pull the nation together. When there is no one to take the nation back to God, there's no hope for that nation. That's the way it is. Now, I know there's going to be revivals. In fact, they got a big one that's going to be coming up in September. I'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. I've already put our ministry on notice of what's going on. And we've got a real problem with that for myself. And our ministry does also. But I'm going to show you how and why. Why, we're against the revival? No, I think revivals are good. But, but can you go to God and have him forgive a nation who doesn't repent of its sins? And a revival is you have to repent of your sins. But until this nation will admit our sins, two of which are the greatest, abortion and homosexuality, you can have all the revivals in the world and God will not answer those revivals. And I don't hear anyone talking about asking for forgiveness for homosexuality and gay marriage in the Christian community. Not on a large scale. Not on a national level. I just don't see it. So now, going on. This was the phrase that we began with. I see a very dark cloud and it's coming from Rome. Abraham Lincoln understood and is revealed in his notes that what he was facing was a, was a spiritual over, over, overcoming a nation that that spirit was coming out of Rome. He wrote in a letter, and I read it earlier, so I won't be reading it today, all of it. I'm going to read part of it. He said that he'd like to bring this up to the rest of the nation about Rome. He said, but it would be like throwing oil on a fire, kindling it. When you read this, you, this had to be understood that only God could reveal that to him. Because God hides that from the rest of the world. When he read that, he knew there was more work he had to do that was going to come after the Civil War. And it appears that the Jesuits knew it too. Wouldn't it have been amazing had God allowed him to live that he had brought this nation back to the Sabbath and the Holy Days? That would have been amazing. He knew more than he wrote. And I've been reading a lot more of his writings lately. So now take a look at this. This is a recent article. This was written way back in May when Donald Trump was meeting with the Pope either before or after, I don't know exactly when, May 20th, 2017, a couple years ago. This is from a Catholic newspaper called The Pulse, the Catholic Pulse, Crux. It said, the lowest point in U.S.-Vatican relations will be hard to beat. What was he talking about? He was focused with his meeting with President Trump, who had turned away from the green, and the whole world was mad at him back then for doing it, because the Pope is pushing the 2030 agenda. And he says this, for that, in other words, for the situation to be worse than it was back in, in May of 2017, he says it'd have to get a lot worse for the worst time in history. He said, for that you need a civil war, a presidential assassination, as, as well as a complete comprehension of the other's worldview. You would have to go back 150 years during the reign of Pope Pius IX. That was the Pope during Abraham Lincoln's day. This is being written from a Catholic newspaper, going back to how bad things got between then and now. This, is, I just, I just, this had no significance to the sermon, except I don't know if you ever saw this or not. When I came across, I was like, whoa, this is in 1870, Pope Pius IX. Look at all the people there. They call that St. Peter's Square. Is that called St. Peter's Square? I, didn't, I couldn't find the name of that. Is that what it's called? But anyway, look at all the people there. What a picture. I said, wow. That's 100 and almost 140 years ago. 
All right, so here, going on now. There's Ezekiel 22. He said, I sought for a man that I should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. So what will happen here is when no one stands in the gap, because this is a prophecy. God says, I found none. Didn't leave any hope there's going to be none, any. He said, I found none. Future tense, just like he warned the nation. When there is no one to stand in the gap, that means that the rest of this nation will go after the remnant of the seed who do. That's you and I. That's prophesied also. So now, when we go into waging this war against the enemy, Abraham Lincoln understood his adversary. Pius, Pope Pius IX, like Francis, the Pope today, began his pontifical career as a reformer. Isn't that what the Pope today is doing? He's reforming the Catholic Church. Oh, no, he's reforming the whole world. He's reforming the whole world, bringing them all back home, back to the Mother Church. Like today, Pope Pius IX was the absolute monarch in his domain. Abraham Lincoln knew that when he went into that office as president, when he ran, that the pressures were going to continue to grow. Pius IX was very unpopular with the non-Catholic population of his day, and riots broke out in 1853 when Archbishop Cateo, Cateo Bedini, labeled the Butcher of Bologna, visited our country. Now, I want you to think back just a couple years to 2015 when the Pope came in and all the people were out in the streets and the millions of people, and he was in the White House, and he was in Congress before all the people and the, the general applaud that he had. That is the enemy that God's people will be facing when God unleashes his protection in this nation. It went on by 1863 that the Confederate leader, Jefferson Davis, actually received a letter from Pope Pius. He sent a letter thanking him. Jeff Davis sent a letter thanking him for offering the prayers for the peace that he had given to the Catholic population in New Orleans. So he had this ongoing thing between the Pope and the South. And the people who were the Protestants and the rest of the nation didn't like it what was going on. And Abraham Lincoln knew that the problem he was facing wasn't the South, it was the spirit that had been driving the leadership of the nation of the South. And it was coming from the Catholics. Following the Civil War, while Thomas Jefferson was in prison, and he was in prison for almost two years, Pius sent an autographed picture to him to pick up his spirits while he was in prison. Following the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, those found to take part were all Catholics but two. There was also evidence that the act of the assassination was orchestrated and financed by the Jesuits. Now there's a scripture that comes to mind when we read this. I'll save it for a little bit later with the elect. President Lincoln warned about the, the, uh, the Jesuits. Now, I'm not going to read that whole letter I read in the first one. So if you want to see the whole letter instead of the parts that I took out today, you need to go back to part one and just listen to that section in there. Very astounding. He said, this is from, this is from Lincoln. I didn't read this, but this is, this is fresh. He said, so many plots have already been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they have, that they have all failed. When we considered the great majority of them were in the hands of skillful Roman Catholic murderers, evidently trained by Jesuits. Can you imagine the President of the United States writing this to somebody? But he did. Going on. He said, my escape from their hands since the letter of the Pope Pius to Jeff Davis has sharpened a million daggers to pierce my breast would be more than a miracle. So he understood that if he lived, it would be a miracle at all. He understood what he was up against wasn't the Civil War. It was here that he was fighting. Now, this is part of the letter. So let me go back to this where we read this. He said, the common people see and hear the big noisy wheels of the Southern Confederacy's cars. 
They called Jeff Davis, Lee, Toombs, Beauregard, Sims, etc. They honestly think that they are the motive power, the first cause of trouble, but this is a big mistake. The true motive power is secreted behind the thick walls of the Vatican, the colleges and the schools of the Jesuits, the convents of the nuns, and the confessional boxes of Rome. He couldn't be any more specific of who he knew his enemy was. He couldn't come to this information had God not gave him that understanding and insight. He said, there is a fact which is too much ignored by the American people. And with that, I am acquainted only since became president. It is that in the best, the leading families of the South have received their education in part, if not in whole, from the Jesuits and the nuns. Hence, those degrading principles of slavery, pride, cruelty, which were a second nature among so many of those people, as I told you before, it is to the popery that we owe this terrible civil war. He believed that he could have found peace if it wasn't for the, the spirit mentality of the people to continue to keep people enslaved. So now, this is a spiritual insight into the future. This was written during the Civil War over 100 years ago. I do not pretend to be a prophet, but though not a prophet, I see a very dark cloud on a horizon, and that dark cloud is coming from Rome. It is filled with tears of blood. It will arise and increase till its flanks will be torn by a flash of lightning, followed by a fearful pearl of thunder. Then a cyclone such as the world has never seen will pass over this country, spreading ruin and desolation from north to south. And after it is over, there will be long days of peace and prosperity for popery with his Jesuits and merciless inquisition will have been forever swept away from our country. Neither I nor you, but our children, will see those things. So he, he transitioned his letter into the spiritual realm of what God showed him that at some future time, that a time where he just said, like the world has never seen, Matthew 24 comes to mind. He said, when that happens, there'll be something that we have never seen before. Then finally, we'll have peace when that rim is gone. He understood that he was fighting evil, that he could not win it unless that evil was destroyed. So God planned now of what Abraham Lincoln goes all the way back to Abraham. In Genesis 15, he says, Know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. They shall serve them. They shall afflict them 400 years. There we go, that 400 years again. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And you shall go to your father in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. I look at our nation and I see the sins growing and growing. And you wonder, so what is God waiting for? And you have to wonder if we haven't reached that tipping point of the, of the Amorites where, where God says, it's not yet full. It's like there's, a, there's a, a ballast out there. It's like you have that weight and you're putting sin in and God's mercy in it. And eventually it just tips so much that there's no returning it. I remember Ryan Dodd taught many, many years ago, when it comes to where a nation no longer repents, and does not know what to repent of, there's nothing there to save. And we are moving into that direction ever so quickly. You can't imagine the harshness of people's minds when they think about the cruelty of death and murder and the attack and the assaults of what's going on today. We see the fulfillment of that specific prophecy come to pass in Exodus 12, verse 41. So it came to pass at the end of 400 years, and 30 years, even the self-same day it came to pass, that the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And you would think that the prophecy was complete, but that is the former, that is the physical. That is not the latter, that is not the spiritual. That is what God said, what God wrote and recorded for us back then is for the end time generation. But we didn't, he didn't tell us that you're going to live through the same thing in your generations as they did back then with 400 years. 
So now, let's take a look at that. Timeline of the events. Here we go. Genesis 15, 13, we just read. In Exodus 12, 41, we just read how God prophesied they'd be afflicted for 400 years, and after the 430 years, they came out. So now, we put our timeline to today. In 1517, the land of Judah, which was Jerusalem, was taken over by the Ottoman Turks. They were there for 400 years. 400 years. If you look at that picture, it says America enters the war April 4, 2017. They marched into Jerusalem. This is General Allenby. It's actually one of the most amazing recordings in modern times of that far past of what was going on as they marched into Jerusalem from the 8th to the 9th of December, and I'll show you that in just a second, was literally 400 years later that this, that, that event took place. For the first time in 400 years, they're coming back to their land. From that time on, from 17 to 1947, when the beginning of the, the uh, Israel, Israel's rule by a British nation, which is one of Joseph's sons, was taken back into Israel again, as God prophesied in the past. All right, going on. From 48, when they become a nation. By the way, I use 47 because that's when the document paper was, was, was filled. It didn't go into place to 48, but it began in 47. So we have here Israel and Judah from 48 till today. Now, the nation of Israel today, a lot of people don't understand, that's not all of Israel today. That's Judah. So what we're looking at here in its fulfillment doesn't take all of Israel. It's really only taking Judah, part of Benjamin, and of course the Levites, Levi. That event in 1917 was prophesied to the very day in the book of Haggai three times. And we cover that in the day of the Lord, right? Three times, Haggai 2, verse 10, 18, and 20, where he says on the 24th day of the ninth month, which was in that year, it fell on the evening of December 8th to the daytime part of December 9th. On the calendar, if you went back and looked at it, that prophecy was fulfilled to the very day, 400 years that God put that out there. Now, if that's not amazing enough, it doesn't fulfill the entire point. Because what about the rest of the tribes of Israel? Does the 400 years form and later apply to them or not? Of course it does. But how? So now, at this time, there was another historical event that took place. So now, before I give you the Israelite portion of it, let me tell you what happened then. There was a Spanish flu that took place. So at the beginning of the coming home, when God began to move his people back into its nation, this flu epidemic takes place. But they said, no, no, it was, 20, it was 1918 that the flu was, not 17, really. Well, it was in 18 that they recognized it was a pandemic around the world. But look at this information. 2014, there was a new theory about the origins of the virus that suggested it first emerged out of where? China. Here we go. How about that? China. National Geographic reported back in 2014, they had previously discovered records that linked the flu to the transportation of the Chinese laborers that the Chinese Labor Corps crossed Canada in 1917 and 1918. They moved approximately 80,000 workers across Europe and into America and Canada because of the war to help with the building efforts during that wartime. So the flu actually began in 17. And it was brought over with them that continued out through 1918. But I brought another one of those pictures in. I don't know when I go across and read this, this kind of stuff. I get fascinated when I see the pictures of what was going on here. Quite different than what you're looking at today. We're trying to isolate everybody. But that was, I think 33 million people died back then. 600 million were affected, I think they said depending on which, one, which report you leave it, 33 million people. So now, when I looked at that, that's about a third of the world. 
was affected and 33 million died. That was getting pretty close to what we read in the seals of the book of Revelation. So I believe what you're looking at here is what God's warning us, the physical that's going to come with the spiritual later. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. This also is history repeating itself. Where have we seen that before? I've actually just covered it with you. You didn't see it. The same thing you're going through today that happened in 1917 happened another time. It's when God began moving Israel out of Egypt. He began with the plagues. So here we see history repeating itself again. God says, you want to see what I'm going to do? Go look at what it did. So now as God's beginning to move his people, where's he moving them to now? Into the new heaven and new earth that's eventually going to come a thousand years from now. A little longer than that, but a thousand years from now. So what you're looking at is the exact plan of God being laid out step by step in your day. Why is he telling us this to us? Because he says, I'm not going to do anything till I show you. He says, he says, I'm not going to do anything until I reveal my secret to my servants. This is what God has put together, historical record of why he recorded all that information. So when the children of Israel, how did they come out? They came out with the plagues. Now, God also did something else. They let certain people go through certain things with all the beginning of the plagues, but then he separated his people. Do you know I've only heard of one case of one person in the church itself die of, of this virus? It is only because Larry Somerville had to go into the hospital in New York City when he had a stroke that he got affected. Other than that, I heard a couple of people got, got the virus, but they got well. I haven't heard of one other single case of any of the churches that has taken place. So what you're looking at today is another miracle of what God is doing, of separating his people to protect them where you are. Did he take you to a place of safety? Yes, he did. It was in Jesus Christ. It's amazing what we're looking at, and we need to recognize what we're seeing and thank God for it. Now, the beginning of 1917, the restoration of what is called Israel today, is actually applied only to the house of Judah. All right, so now, what about the house of Israel? Now, I know this is, this is going to be replacement theology for some people who may, who may be watching or tuning in, but it's really not. When you look at the prophecy of the houses coming back together, that doesn't take place fully until Christ returns. So the house of Israel don't even know who the house of Israel are unless God reveals it to them, and that's been revealed to his church. So what about the house of Israel versus the house of Judah? We just seen that they went back in 1917. But what about the house of Israel? What about the lost tribes? Do they not come under the same 400 years? Well, let's see. So now let's move our little arrow across the bottom of the page here. I'm going to bring us to 2020. What major event took place 400 years ago in 2020? Boy, we had that little sound. Do, 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 do. Remember that, that, that was that Jeopardy, that little Jeopardy thing? Anybody got to get Jeopardy? Can you play that Jeopardy thing for me over here? <laughs> Somebody, who? The Pilgrims. The Pilgrims. There we go. We got one. Give that man a prize. <laughs> the Pilgrims. They landed on Pil Plymouth Rock, 1620. 400 years ago. To begin work in this land. All right? 400 years ago. What about the coronavirus? There was a virus with the, the virus began with the timing of the Israelites coming out. There was a timing with Judah going back to the land. And here we look 400 years later, what are we looking at? The virus is connected to this time also, 400 years. By the way, September, I think it's September 6th or 16th, is exactly 400 years to the day. It's 400 years. But it gets better than that. This gets really good now. So what about the Pope? Remember, the Pope is going to 2030. The, everybody's worried about the 2030, the end of the world supposed to happen, Remember? Because we're all going to go green, yes, we're all going to die. 
So now let's move our little arrow over to 2030. So now, what happened in 2030, 400 years ago? Got our music playing again? All right, I'll bring it up. John Winthrop lands on Salem. Now, he didn't stay there. Of course, he moved, but he landed on Salem in 1630, 400 years ago. What does Salem represent? It was the early name that they understood as for Jerusalem, where God's headquarters was. It also meant peace, Jesus Christ being peace. What we're looking at here, you see Jeru Jerusalem and Judah, 400 years coming back in. You're looking at the house of Israel, 400 years coming back in. The physical, picturing the time of the return of Christ, 400 years. This is eventually where God was going to with Abraham. So Abraham moved and he looked for a land whose city and builders was that made without hands and never found it. He never lived in a physical built house again. He lived in tit as a no man for the rest of his life. Because this is what he was looking for. The return of Jesus Christ. So God has laid out the plan with 400 years all the way through. He has connected his people. And each time it does, there's a war beginning to take place around a virus of Satan to destroy God's plan for salvation. And either God would bring his plagues or Satan would bring his plagues. But either way, there was a civil war that was taking place at each one of those events. At each event, when God began to move, Satan was there to destroy. Abraham Lincoln knew that. When they were with Moses, they killed all, the, all the, the male babies. When it was Jesus Christ, they killed all the males, child between two and under. They killed them all. And the next time, he's going after the elect, the children of God. Now, you can't put this together on your own. There's no way that you can equate and lay these things out thousands of years in advance. But you are living through this period right now of the last phase in God's plan. There's the physical, and there's the spiritual. So now I asked the question, he said, does it pass muster? Yeah, it passes muster. So what, whether you realize it or not, I really believe that we are in this time, that we don't have a lot of time left. But you know what's really hard to imagine? What do we do in the meantime? Well, God's got a lot of blank pages to be filled. And he's going to be filling those pages with his people to be recorded for later. The coronavirus makes the Vatican postpone the Global Education Pact promoting the Pope's new humanism. We've talked about this over and over and over in the past year. So now, the event will be moved from May, which was actually a began to establish on, on the actual beginning of the birth of modern-day Israel, which is Judah, of course, on May 14th. But he postponed it to the end in, uh, of, of September. I don't think I have the date down, but believe it or not, he postponed it to the day after the Feast of Tabernacles, last great, of undev day of last great day. The very next day, he starts his event. I, have, I, saw, I said that, I said, I wonder if God wouldn't let him do it on the last great day this time. Because he came in on the torment, remember, and sat in the White House. So you wonder if you wouldn't let this event. said, no. And the guy says, no, you're not going to rain on my parade this time. <laughs> and made him wait till the next day. So it begins, I think, on a Sunday this, this time for his deal. So he's going to launch his initiative in September for the global education this coming year. Now, this is really interesting. We did this back in December 13th. Pope Francis talked about the fundamentalist or a scourge, brain implants. Where do we go from here? And the mark of the beast never realizing what we were coming to just a couple minutes, months later. This was out on in, uh, in November 18th, talking about changing our culture of beliefs in his new program. Pope Francis declared that the Christian fundamentalists are a scourge. Now pay attention to this fundamentalist because I've got a four minute video I'm going to show you in just a couple minutes. This is from the National Catholic Reporter. It said religious fundamentalists are a plague, the Pope says. Beware the fundamentalist groups. Everyone has one, so there goes the neighborhood, you let one in. 
Heard that phrase? In Argentina, there is a little fundamentalist in the corner. It says, let us try with fraternity to go forward. Fundamentalism is a scourge, and all religions have some kind of fundamentalist first cousin there, which forms a group. And we are a fundamentalist group. Another word for, for the scourge, they're a plague. So here we are with the plague again, coming into this. So now, here's a video. It was taped in the Pentagon. In 2005, this is Bill Gates, 2005, and it's called the FunVac Seminar to the Pen Pentagon. Nice, warm, happy name, right? It's actually Fundamentalist Vaccination. This is the abbreviation, FunVac. It's only four minutes long. In light of what the Pope talked about with fundamentalism versus this vaccination they're trying to make, it ought to make you shudder. Are we ready to play that video? Yeah, go ahead and play the video. I'll be in just a few minutes. We have individuals who are religious fun fundamentalists, religious fanatics, and this is the expression, uh, RT-PCR, real-time PCR uh, expression of the VMAT2 gene. Over here, we have individuals, so, in theory, so, right? so let, let me complete. So over here, we have uh, individuals who are not particularly uh, fundamentalists, not particularly religious, and you can see there's a, a much reduced uh, expression of, of this particular gene, the, the VMAT2 uh, gene. Uh, another evidence that, that supports our, our hypothesis for the development of, of, of this um, approach. Uh, so what you're what suggesting you see, here is by, by, by spreading this virus, we're going to eliminate individuals from donning on a bomb vest and going into a market and blowing up the market. So our, our hypothesis is that these are fanatical people, uh, that they have overexpression of the VMAT2 gene, and that by vaccinating them against this, we'll eliminate this behavior. Uh, so we have some, some very, very uh, remarkable data in this next slide. Uh, here we have two uh, brain scans. These are fMRIs. Uh, these are two different individuals with different levels of expression of VMAT2. Uh, on top uh, is an individual who's a religious fanatic, an individual, and we've repeated this numerous times, that, that uh, has uh, high levels of VMAT2. Now, um, this individual down here who had low levels of the VMAT2 gene, this individual would uh, self-describe as, as, as not particularly religious in, in each case. Uh, these individuals were, were read a religious text. Uh, this individual uh, light lit up um, this, the right middle frontal gyrus uh, shown here, and uh, that's a part of the brain that's associated with theory of mind. Uh, it's a part of the brain that, that uh, has to do with intents and, and beliefs and, and desires. Uh, in contrast, in marked contrast, here's an individual who would uh, not particularly uh, self-describe as, as religious. And when they're read a religious text, <clears throat> what you see is that this part of the brain called the anterior insula lights up. This is a part of the brain that's associated with, with disgust or displeasure on hearing something. Uh, so you're suggesting I take a CT scan with me when I'm uh, evaluating people to determine whether I put a bullet <laughs> in their head? So, so um, the, the data that I'm presenting here uh, supports uh, the, the concept that, that we're proposing. Uh, and I think that uh, we would not propose to do uh, CT scans or fMRIs on, on individuals out in the hinterlands of, of Afghanistan. The virus would immunize against this VMAT2 gene, and that would, would have the effect that you see here, which is it's essentially to turn a fanatic into a, a, a normal person. And we think that will have major effects in the Middle East. How would you suggest that this is going to be dispersed, the aerosol? Well, so, so the, the present uh, plan and the tests that we've done so far um, have used uh, uh, respiratory viruses, uh, such as flu or, or uh, rhinoviruses. And uh, we believe that that's a satisfactory way to get the exposure of the largest uh, part of the population. Most of us, of course, have, ha have been exposed to both of those viruses. And, and we're, we're quite confident that, that this will be a, a, a very successful uh, approach. This is fascinating. What's the name of this proposal? 
Yeah, so, so the name of this project is FunVax, which is the vaccine for religious fundamentalism. And you have a proposal already? The proposal uh, has just been submitted, and I think that the data that I have shown you today would, would support uh, the, the development of, of this project, and we think it has great promise. It has great promise. Now, when they had that seminar, it was primarily for the fanaticism of people blowing each other up in the Middle East. The Pope has now moved the fundamentalism into mainstream Christianity. And as you've noticed, it's kind of funny that I was watching like, the Blue Angels and uh, the Thunderbirds flying over New York City this morning in the news, and they had all the people coming out of the hospital and there's like hundreds of them on the sidewalk, really, really close. There was no six foot rule. And I'm looking at that, I said, wow. I said, if that was a church today, they'd arrest all those people and put them in jail. So what they're proposing is to take that information and put it in the same vaccination, vaccine, that's gonna be used to stop the virus. That's gonna to begin to control your thoughts and your mind for fundamentalism. And you needed to be aware of that, what's going on here. So it has reached more outside of just worrying about people blowing up each other, but they actually look at fundamental Christians and some of the pastors who said, I'm not going to shut down, I'm going to go to church, as religious fanatics who are not caring for the welfare of the nation or their people. And so they have had some arrested, and others who knows what will happen down the road when the next virus that comes is worse than this one. You needed to be aware of this. Now, going on, now watch what happens when the next administration allows the Constitution to be removed. UN experts wants world religions to bow to the UN ideology. This is from CBN News. United Nations Special Expert on Religious Freedom says it is time for the world's leading religions to submit to the authority of the UN and its human rights bodies, even though the critics say that these bodies are laced with fringe leftist views. It's all about who should have the final say on the issues of law and policy, and the UN expert is saying that the UN's ideas should override the beliefs of mainstream religions. If you oppose that, you're in the camp that needs some fun vac. In other words, these people are not thinking straight. We need to be able to control these people. Amid Shahid, who is the UN Special Rapporteur to the Freedom of Religion and Belief, wrote about the, how the religion and the gender equality have reached a clash at this annual report. Meanwhile, she tries to flip the freedom of religion, saying, upside down, saying the right to freedom of religion protects individuals, not religions as such. He then contends that the law is based on traditional morality, which is often come from religious roots, should be repealed if they conflict with the opinions of the human rights scholars and UN experts. Have y'all heard any of this before? The coming captivity. I'm going to begin to wrap up. I've got about, I think about 10 minutes. The coming captivity in Isaiah. God says he's going to go in that day. He's going to gather the remnant of his people a second time. So where we're going, we're going into lockdown in a spiritual way. Is that eventually God's going to have to come rescue his people from captivity. This series has done three things for me to be able to bring out. One, it should be a warning and wake up call for the church. And if what I just showed you in the last 10 minutes doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. If the virus hasn't woke everybody up in the church up in the last couple of months, I don't know what will. I mean, you got to be, who's the guy who slept for 100 years? Rip Van Winkle. Yeah, Rip Van Winkle. I mean, you got to be a Rip Van Winkle not to see that. Second, showing us the beginning of the captivity phase of our nation, talking about an economic removal being the first. And then third is it lays the groundwork for the second phase of our removal. And believe it or not, God even shows us how from what we're looking at, where it's going to go. So what was the former for the ancient Israel when they went into captivity? They went into captivity in three phases. The Assyrians came from the north to destroy Israel. Israel bought them off by paying tribute. It removed their economic wealth for phase one. 
The first phase of the, the removal had begun with their economic removal of their finances. So what are we looking at today? Look what Trump said. He says, I want all Americans to understand that we are at war with an invisible enemy, but that enemy is no match for the spirit and resolve of the American people. I'm afraid that ain't true without God. And see, herein lies the problem with President Trump. He still believes he can do it. Yeah. I understand. I mean, and here, you know, it's amazing how many people think that I'm, I'm, on, I'm just in Trump's camp all the time. And I'm not. I mean, I, I pray that I'm in God's camp. But here's what people in the church need to understand. They said, well, you know, we never talked about politics in the church all those years ago. So, no, we didn't. But I'm telling you, we talk today because you see the politics are affecting your life that didn't affect it the way they did back then. The election periods now are going to make the difference between how you are able to meet freely or not. We're in a different ballgame. We're not talking about politics because I want to be a politician. I talk about politics because what's, that's what's involving the factor of our lives going down the road. Look what it says. We're asked not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. There's nobody on this earth stronger than Satan by yourself. You need to understand that. Without, without Jesus Christ's protection, you are vulnerable to be destroyed. So now, look at 1776. These are the three phases of the removal of captivity. And by understanding this, we understand when we move into the second phase of captivity for God's people and this nation. 745 was the first removal, and that was for the wealth of Israel. Second was the, the loss of their governance. The third removal was when they lost their identity and have been lost ever since. God also showed they came back the same way out of captivity 2,520 years later in each phase. 1776, the beginning of the wealth were being restored. 1789 was the completion of the Constitution, fully enacted with all the states, even though it was initiated in 1787. That was the beginning of the restoration of self-governance. In 1803, it was the beginning of the fulfillment of the destiny of America. They go into captivity in three ways. They come out of captivity in three ways. That's the former. That's the physical. The later is where you are living through today. All right? Here we go. Ancient Israel went into captivity in three ways. We just showed you that. So now we go from 2017, which I believe, and I can't prove it yet, but I believe with all certainty in my mind from everything we've laid out, I believe that began the notice of the day of the Lord beginning. Now, if you just picked this sermon up for the first time, you just probably thought I just jumped out a window when I said that. But I'm asking you to go back into the sermon, the day of the Lord. And there's, there's, I think, four. I believe that has four parts into it. And listen to it step by step of what God says. And if not, it certainly was a notification that we're doing something. So now, the coronavirus, I believe that's the first shot of the actual civil war. Right now. I don't believe this is just a warning. I think we're in that wake up call for the church. When you look in the book of Revelation, what's the first thing John is told to do? Go warn the churches. The day of the Lord had begun. He was already in the day of the Lord. He says, get them ready for the seals that's coming when Jesus Christ opens up the book. I believe we are right here at that first shot, the warning, to get the churches waking up to get ready for Jesus Christ's return. What was the first thing that happened to Israel in their removal? Is their wealth by a foreign nation. What has the coronavirus done to this nation? It has destroyed us. It has decimated us. We're talking five, six, eight million dollars, trillion dollars. They're talking now that if the, the states don't get another trillion dollars, they're going to go under. The Catholic Church here in New Orleans, the Archdiocese, just filed bankruptcy this morning. And this had nothing to do with the virus. It's pedophilia. Because they didn't take care of business. What a sin sick world we had. Oh, the Catholic Church. Oh, who did Lincoln say his problem was? The Catholic Church. All right, let's go on. The second wave. Now, this is going to give us, God says, I'm not going to do it till I tell you beforehand, so I'm going to show you something. I believe God is showing us today beforehand what's going on. Before the seals take place, I believe this is going to happen. When do they happen? I got everything centered around the election, not because I'm in favor of elections. Because when Jesus Christ comes back, you don't vote for him. He is king. 
He has qualified. He's going to take everybody else out and say, you will follow me or you will be consumed. I don't care what politics you are involved into. So now, when you get to this stage, wherever those seals begin, and I put it on a, a slide track so I can move them, is giving up our governance. And I just showed you some points of the UN, what they want to do with religions when they get a hands on us. And just a few years ago, the United States almost voted to give them authority to work within our own confines of our own nation, taking away the Constitution. When that Constitution disappears, you have just moved into the second phase of the removal of Israel, of this nation. And I don't mean you've got to get rid of the whole Constitution. It is rewriting it. God says the end time they're going to change laws. The protection that you and I have today to give you the sermon I'm giving you today is only allowed because there is a Constitution to protect us. Now, let's go on. Here's what I just showed you. When America chooses to relinquish the Constitution, that will be the day we have begun the second phase of our captivity. And it will happen in a blink of an eye, and this world will never know it even happened to them. But God's people will. Because God says, I'm not going to do it till I show you first. And I believe I have just showed you when it is. And I will stand on that. The third wave. It was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. What was the third phase for Israel? They lost their identity. Fortunately, at this time, Jesus Christ is going to come back. And he's going to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth to save those people. So now... I want to close the sermon today with, the, with a connection of Abraham Lincoln, Revelation 13, verse 7, which is the scripture that I have right here. Abraham Lincoln knew what he was up against. We see from Lincoln's writings that before he ever ran, that he understood that it was possible that he would be assassinated. He knew what he was up against. Nevertheless, he counted the cost, and he did the job. In the first sermon I gave on this series, I brought out a slide that's called Counting the Cost. And I brought out the second Counting the Cost. We all know what it was like to go through counseling for baptism, to make up our mind that we're in this for the long haul, you know, we're going to do this the way God says to do it. We're going to repent of our sins. And no matter what, we're going to follow God. Well, that's fine in peacetime. But you are moving into the civil war. A spiritual civil war that your enemy is relentless. You don't know where it's coming from. And he will cut you off at your knees without Jesus Christ protecting you. No president. No senator, no congressman can stop what's coming. God and God alone with Jesus Christ at the helm can do that. And he alone can do that. The end time generation is going to have a second counting the cost. What I'm giving you today is what's coming is worse than I can describe. I've been blessed in one sense of the word that God has put something inside of me following Hurricane Katrina. It never leaves. There's a fire and a, and, a, and, a, and a desire to put out with all intensity the warning that there is. I have a hard time giving a sermon on happy things. I looked over my last few years and, you know, I'm a fun guy. <laughs> I, like, I like happy things. But it's almost as if I'm, I'm hidden from doing that. I, like, I can't do that. When we didn't have news nuggets and insights and I was delivering the sermon, I knew I had to deliver meat in due season, so we do the Holy Day sermons. Or if I had to do something on Christian living. Those, you need those. I understand you need those. But inside, the whole time, I said, man, I, I, I can't. I need, to, I need to focus on doing this. So the blessing of doing news nuggets and insights is a relief for me. It's something that I needed to be able to get out. And we have other ministry who can do Christian living. And they do fine jobs at all of that. But what we need is the warning. 
what good does it do you of Christian living if you know that there's no going to be no Christian living in a couple of years unless you repent? It comes down to God's people. All of God's churches need to understand they need to take the labels off, their, the, the back labels of uh, this church of God, this ministry or that ministry. All that's not going to mean anything in the years ahead. I can't imagine if Christ comes back and he says at the end of 2,000 years, beginning of the 30,000th year, that I've got nine years to go before he comes back. If you had nine years to go, what are you going to fill your pages with your life? If they come to you and you're at church like we're sitting here, and I've got, I don't know what the, I don't know what the numbers are, what, how many people we can have in here. But I know whatever it was with 10, we're way over that today. You know what? I don't care. God's protected us. You're distancing yourself. If you can distance yourself in a grocery store and have hundreds of people go watch angels flying over, why can't we do it in church? You understand where I'm coming from. There's going to come a time they're not going to let you. And they're going to walk in. They're going to drag out the pastors. They're going to put them in jail. And they're going to bring you, as the Bible says, before magistrates. That time's coming. And you need to get ready for it. How well did you prepare for this one? Did you have enough food? Were you short toilet paper? We have just begun to see what's coming. This is the wake-up call. It's the first shot. This is the beginning of a long battle before the return of Jesus Christ. In conclusion, the final lesson from Lincoln, I always want to leave with something encouraging for you because all of what I'm telling you, as bad as it may sound, is the greatest story I could ever give you. Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to put an end to all of this. And if it takes your life, my life, so be it. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And he says, we can, we're going to put you in the fire and see if your God will save you. And remember their words? He said, whether God's going to save us or not, doesn't make any difference. We are not going to bow down to you. And it made him so mad, he said, put that fire up even higher. So here we go. Therefore, seeing we have a so compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, and I went through the sermon today, not to give you opinion, but to give you historical documentation of the former, the latter, the physical, the spiritual, the events that are all taking place and how they're lined up. And they're there for you in front of your eyes today that you're living through. So we have this great cloud of witnesses, not just the former, but here today in our midst. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so does easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Abraham Lincoln understood when he took on the challenge to defeat the Pope and the evil that was centered around that spiritual church that he put his life on the line. And it was more than just a civil war for slavery. It was the evil that he knew would not be defeated in his day. It will be defeated in ours. Because we live in that time when Jesus Christ is coming back. He's going to put all this to, 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 to naught. He's going to be able to resurrect his people. And those who have been put captive, he's going to bring them back. And he's going to restore. And he said, the last shall be first. And he's going to be granting you and a reward and eternal with him to rule and reign for eternity in a thousand years on this earth. But you've got to count the cost. You need to think about what's going on today and be ready. Because this is coming. We have a great cloud of witnesses coming. Wouldn't it be nice that in the millennium, when the people were in church on Sabbath or in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they begin to give them a lesson, and they open up the pages that's been recorded for this generation, that your name is being read at that time. What a great opportunity God has given you and I. We've got to hold fast. We've got to stay together. We've got a lot of work to do. For all of you who've been watching and being a part of this work, we want to thank you for your help. By the way, our income had picked up. You know, we've been blessed. You know, I, can't, I can't believe how God's really blessed us. The numbers of the people watching have been picking up. We are well over to 3,200 subscribers now. Uh, and and, and uh, News Nuggets and Insights, well over that now. And, and it's just been growing. So I appreciate all that. I'm glad to see everybody back. Not everybody, but a lot of you are back. Let's hang together. Let's hang tight. Let's be smart. 
Let's focus on God. Let's go to him on our knees and remember that he is our savior, our protector, our great healer. And with him, we can accomplish all things.